All right. All right. Well, I'm, I'm a little scared. So I'm just going to get off the stage. Just give me a quick kiss. Just give me. Sure. Right, let's try this. This is, this is really awkward. Let me. You, you know, I'm just going to sit down. It's, yeah, look at this. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. You can't. Guitarists are just high strung. So I they're didn't, just all the way. Uh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, ouch. Um, it, it's hard to kiss you when, you when you're holding a fence. But um, bum. Actually, it's pretty good at that pun because actually today's title is Uprooting Offense. Not offense, offense. So today, as uh, we get ready to get into the Word of God, get, get, just get your pictures now. Just get your pictures now. All right. Okay. Is this good? Good angle? All right. Uh, today, we are going to talk about offense, and you're already offended. But uh, no, we're going to talk about offense and what holding on to offense actually does to us. And then we're going to take some time to examine how we can uproot offense and live a life that is free from offense. So uh, before we get started, I actually would love to uh, start with a, a video that I found just recently on YouTube. If you don't mind, just playing that video for us. Oh, yeah, I'm a great dad. I've been spending a lot of quality time with my daughter recently. Let's do this. Let's just, oh, cheers. Cheers. Just Cheers. Casual Cheers. hangout times. Mm. I feel like that's where that's who's connected right now. Hey, I'll hey. keep She loves it. Absolutely loves it. It's not time for Been reading with her. Forts. Um, tuck her in at night. Come on. Make sure that she's not going to have any of these bad dreams. She's been talking weird dreams. She's been talking about recently of like, like things falling on her, like giant. Wooden beams, she's saying? Weird. It's been like this for months. We're surviving. But it's miserable. Uh, finances right now, they're a little tight. Um, a lot of things have been broken recently in our house. Um, I feel like I always have to go get some more cereal. My wife, she's kind of packing it right now. Maybe she might prepare hers. Hibernation. Bun in the oven. Doesn't want to tell me about it. Not cool. No, no. I don't know. I'm, I feel like my wife and I, recently, we just, we haven't been connecting. This is, it's like there's something, just, something that's in between us or, just feels like there's just something between us. I don't know. I mean, I tried to talk to her about it. Uh, but you know, women, they just, they give you those signs and clues. They don't really ever tell you what's going on. It's definitely something with her, though. I mean, not me. My boss, he says that... I need to just let some things go. Hello? Hello? It's maybe some sort of leadership type principle that he's trying to bring on the team. Or maybe just me. I haven't really seen him talk to about the same else. But no, I mean, he says I need to let some things go. But I, I, don't, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm not, I'm not holding on to anything. Work? No, yeah, it's great. Recently I've been promoted. Well, I mean, I mean, not to a better area. I've been promoted to, uh, well, I guess it's de demoted. But I mean, um, yeah, I'm seeing this as an opportunity, this demotion as an opportunity, all right? You know, I'm not gonna let this get me upset. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be upset. Am I offended? <laughs> Does it look like I'm holding a fence? <laughs> so are we good? Yeah, all right, all right, good. Waste of my time. All right. So just a little start to the sermon. Thought that was very uh, perfect because uh, oftentimes we think that 
offense is just something I have between just one individual, but it actually affects every individual. You think that you can compartmentalize, yep. (laughs) And you think that, okay, this is just between she and I, but what ends up happening is that you, what you do not realize is you're bringing it into your home, you're bringing it into your workplace, you're bringing it into multiple relationships, because what actually happen is, happens is you become a prisoner to the offense. And now everybody's paying for your offense. So we think that uh, offense is just between you and I, but, but actually offense can even, that we have with somebody else, can actually a, a f- cause some issues with our relationship with God. Oh, praise the name. I don't feel like I'm connecting. Why is everyone else having a great time in worship? I'm not feeling anything. Something's going on here. Maybe I just need to read the word. You know, there there are some things that can get in the way of our relationships. And that is the prison of offense. So today, I'm gonna talk about two different categories of people who pick up offenses. There's one group that they are genuinely offended by how they were unjustly treated. And then you have another category of those who believe that they've been unjustly treated when they're actually functioning on improper, uh, improper information, right? A lot of times uh, offenses come in, in marriages when expectations aren't met, right? I know I came in to, with an expectation in my marriage that my husband was going to be the one that took out the trash. <laughs> Boy, did I learn that our house is equal opportunity. <laughs> See, I was, I was, you know, just going by what I saw in my house. My mom doesn't touch that trash. It's a man's job. Well, that's what I expected, but he... He grew up with a single mom who did everything. Took out the trash, did, did it all. So I came into the marriage, and when he didn't take out the trash, I'm thinking, he is failing as a husband. I am offended. And then that was probably one of our first arguments. And then it became on how hot the thermostat was or wasn't. We actually had to get marriage counseling on that thermostat, and I think uh, Apostle Dave and Pastor Nancy might remember that. (laughs) I was offended because I wanted it at, what, 75? I know. (laughs) Now I'm offended at all of you. (laughs) And he wanted it like 67, big difference. So, anyway, other, other ways that people are offended is when they're imagined, their imaginary laws are broken. Okay, so you all know that this is group therapy for me, right? So, if I'm going to just tell, I'm telling you, holding an offense wrecks havoc on everything. But recently, I had... Um, at our, at our home in our neighborhood, our neighbors from a few houses down have decided to park kind of in front of our house for some reason. And um, I was really ticked off, I'll be honest, very ticked off. You have your own area. Is this a parking lot? No. Um, just tell, I'm just telling you how it is. And, and now I carefully have to, not, I always should carefully, but I even more carefully have to uh, pull out and reverse out of my driveway, making sure I don't hit their vehicle. Anyone ever been there before? That person broke my law of thou shalt not park 10 feet within my distance of my driveway. And then my son, I started complaining to my son, so rude. 
And he said, well, how about you call the neighborhood association? I said, well, actually there's no really law against that. (laughs) And then I came to realize they're breaking my own personal law. And they're not even aware that they're breaking my own personal law because it isn't a real law. And now I'm offended because they broke my law. And how many people are walking around because your laws have been broken? Your expectations have not been met. I want to talk about what Jesus said about offense. He said in Luke 17, 1, he says, offenses will certainly come. And then Jesus said in in another area of scripture is talking about the last days and what's going to happen in the last days. And it makes it sound like it definitely the last days are today. Because he says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I want you to realize that he's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. That's scary to me. That in the last days, many within the church shall be offended. Let it not be so of Word of Life Christian Center, which is why we try to bring a word A word that corrects, a word that restores, a word that edifies, not sugarcoating it. And you'll probably wish I sugarcoated some things today, but I can't because I don't want to be a part of that church that's easily offended. And then later it says, and the love of the majority shall grow cold. He's still talking about the church. Because of offenses which then lead to betrayal, which then lead to hatred. Now the love of many are growing cold. It all started with offense. Maybe your relationship with God is growing cold and can it all come back to a root of offense? I knew that the Holy Spirit put this message on my heart And I believe 100% without doubt, and I do not say this lightly, that the devil did not want this message taught today. And I'm going to tell you why. Never in all of my life have I been physically attacked so suddenly like this week. I've been hit by a truck before on foot. And, And it didn't hurt as much then as it did this week. I landed myself in the ER. Sorry, Mom, Dad, I didn't tell you. But <laughs> I knew something was going on because these were odd things that was taking place within my body. And I know that the devil's scheme is to stop you from hearing the word of God that, the, that God Almighty wants you to hear. So I knew, and I don't say that everything is an attack because I believe you're responsible for a lot of those things that you call an enemy attack. But I absolutely believe that the enemy attacked because he did not want this word to come forth. And therefore, what I'm going to ask you to do with me right now is I would like to pray because I do believe that the devil wants many believers offended so that they are ineffective in the kingdom of God. And so that there's division in, his, in, the, in the church of Jesus Christ. So therefore, we must take our stand. And so I'm going to pray right now. And I want to ask that you would join your faith with me. And let's pray together. Father God, we are so humbled to be in your presence, O oh God. And Father, I thank you that we have started this day with praise, with worship, with adoration. And God, our hearts have been prepared to hear the word of God now. And Father, I just pray that any any distraction concerning this word would be canceled in the name of Jesus. Any assignment against this body in the name of Jesus shall be canceled. Father, I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you expose hindrances expose offenses, expose sin in this place so that we can be freed and be the people of God that we've been called to be, oh God. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, have your way. 
And I thank you, Jesus, that greater is he who lives in us than he who lives in the world. And we close the door on the work of the enemy right now. Nothing of the enemy shall penetrate this word coming forth. And I thank you for a hedge of protection around the minds, the spirits, the souls here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it says, as I said, that in the last days many will be offended. But isn't that the truth overall? That we are living in the most uh, offended days ever? Everyone's offended over everything. The littlest word, the, the one-line articles in the media, social media. And the devil will use that to influence the church to get the people of the church offended. You can actually see it on social media when a believer picks up an offense. Facebook tells it all. But the, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18, so I'm just going to read a piece of that. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him. Who's him? Jesus. As we are changed into his glorious image. Do you know the Holy Spirit actually has an assignment? The Holy Spirit actually has a job. And part of his job is to cause you to grow more and more, day by day, month by month, year by year, into the image of Jesus Christ. Meaning that your very character is to be Christ-like. The Holy Spirit has an assignment. You are his assignment. Romans 8.28 says, God turns all things around for the good. Well, I believe that God will allow offenses to use it for your good. I believe that he will use offenses to mold you and shape you into his character. Because offenses will come, but what you do with it is your decision. There, there is a, a, a scripture that I pray before I minister on Sundays. I get on my face and, and I say this prayer that John 3.30 says is, He must increase. I must decrease. You know, it's an oxymoron that born-again believers are easily offended. Hear me now. It should be an oxymoron that Christians are easily offended because the very one that they center their faith on, the very one Jesus that they are, are destined to become more like is the very one who dropped every offense that you ever committed against him. To live and stay offended opposes the very heart of the gospel you claim to believe. Now there's a parable found in Matthew 18. If you'd like, you can go there, Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. There's a parable of two debtors and, and an unforgiven creditor. See, there was this king he wanted to settle his accounts, and this one servant owed him millions. And so he, he called for the servant and, and said to the servant, you owe me millions, and it's now time to pay up. And, and the, the servant said, but I don't have it. I can't pay that debt. I can't do it. Please have mercy on me. Because the king wanted to send him and, and his, his family into, uh, into slavery if he is not going to pay his debt. And so the servant pleaded, and, and the king ended up having mercy on the servant and forgave him the millions of dollars that was owed to him. But that same servant later on found someone who owed him just a few thousand dollars, grabbed him by the neck and said, you better pay me now what you owe me. And then people in the, in the area found out or heard and saw what he did and they went to the king and let's read what the king says in 
Matthew 18, verses 32 through 35. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. We are expected to forgive others just as our heavenly father has forgiven us. I know in our marriage we, we, we will state over our marriage that we forgive much because we have been forgiven much. There's a lot of spouses that have forgotten how much they have been forgiven. And they're walking into their bedroom with offense. And they're walking and walking in, and around their children holding offense. You think your children don't notice it? But here it is, the king saying, I, I forgave you that millions but you could not forgive just thousands? That really makes me think that we cannot fathom how much offense Jesus has taken care of, how much offense Jesus has forgiven, but we expect others to pay up. If God dropped all the charges against you, which would lead to death, really, who are you? to hold on to that offense. No sugar today. See, in this parable, the unforgiving servant was sent to prison to be tortured. But here it is, this great quote by Lewis B. Smedes. It says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Come here for a second. So, so I, say he, he, he has done me wrong, right? But who looks like they're in prison? Who looks pretty uncomfortable right now? I am more miserable holding on to this offense while he's enjoying life. Look at him. What good is it doing that I'm holding this offense? It's not helping me out, any. He's not carrying this for me. Thank you, honey. You know, there's a lot of homes that have been turned into a prison because someone is holding offense. And just like we saw in that video, it's not just the wife who pays but the job pays, the children pay, family pays. And do you recognize that Satan wants more than anything to bring division into your family? And he wants more than anything to bring division into the family of God? We are so blessed that we are a multicultural, multi-generational church that is by the Spirit of God. But do you know the devil hates it? And he wants to divide it. And he wants to bring offenses from culture against culture, generation against generation. But let it not be so at Word of Life Christian Center. Let it be said that we have love that shows that we are his. We have love for one another that testifies of the great love of our God. Now, that, that video that we saw was by John Bevere's ministry, is, and because he writes a, a great book called The Bait of Satan. I've only read a couple pages, but I've heard a lot of people have read it, and it's changed a lot of lives. I thought, for, it, was, I thought it was really funny to call a book The Bait of Satan. That Bait of Satan. So, that's, just what I, that's how I heard it. It was just, that, what an odd title. But then I realized that Satan is trying to constantly get us offended so that we will take the bait 
leading us into imprisonment. John 10.10 10 tells us about the thief, the devil. He only wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life and more abundantly. So here I thought it was a strange title. One of Satan's most deceptive and hidden baits is offense and will lure you right into a trap. So he cannot wait. He is like that lying, just tiptoeing, ready to catch you. And the, the actual word that Jesus uses regarding offense actually is a Greek word called scandalon. And it actually means a bait stick, a, a stick that would lure the animal into the trap. Have you ever seen maybe some of those cats with the little feathers on it? Just lure it into the trap, and bam, that animal is imprisoned. I thought it was quite interesting that the word offense denotes that it's a trap. And then also, it's also called a stumbling block. Offense is a stumbling block. The enemy will roll out those stumbling blocks ready to trip you up, ready for you to fall for it. Offenses will come, but what you choose to do with them is up to you. See, offense, is not, it's, it's an event. It's, it's not a sin. The sin is holding on to the offense. Why do I say that? Because I think about how Jesus said in, in the, the Lord's Prayer, as forgive me as I have forgiven others. So I want to ask you a question today, and, and quite honestly, I've had to ask myself this question. Often you'll, you'll know when something's just off on you. Maybe it's spiritually, there's, there's a disconnect. Maybe there's a disconnect between you and your spouse or, or something at work or, or a relationship. So my question that I really want you to ask yourself, because it's a great question to ask yourself, is are you living offended? Psalm 139, 23, and 24 says, search me, O God and know my heart. See, this scripture, I love it because it's, it's a self-examination scripture and saying, Holy Spirit, reveal my heart to me. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I thought it was quite interesting when David used this word grievous and see if there be any grievous way in me. I thought, that reminds me another, of another scripture in Ephesians 4, 30 and 31. And it goes like this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, I don't know about you, but when I just even read that scripture, I want to know, well, how can I grieve the Holy Spirit? Because I don't want to do that. Well, when you read scripture, you, you have to read it within context. And that even means reading before that scripture and after that scripture. And what comes before that scripture of not grieving the Holy Spirit is how you talk to someone, how you deal with someone. But then the following preceding scripture gives it even more clarity that this is how you can grieve the Holy Spirit. In verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. How many know the top ingredient on the list is the most prominent, the most important ingredient? I, you, my father taught me that. He said, if you, if you see a cereal and the first two ingredients has sugar in it, you're not getting it. So we ate wheat checks. <laughs> and wheat bread. And, and when there was no regular syrup in the house, they made me eat caro syrup. 
Oh, I'm sorry, we got to get back to the word. Right. I mean, caro syrup. For pancake syrup? Okay. I'm over it. I see you eat pancakes with caro syrup. I'm sorry. Get rid of all bitterness. So, but the first ingredient here that I see in, in not grieving the Holy Spirit is get rid of all bitterness. So I thought, well, let me look at the definition of bitterness. And it was quite interesting when I found the definition. Anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. Resentment. Wow, that sounded like what I began with, those two categories of people. Those who have genuinely been just unjustly treated and those who believe they've been unjustly treated. So let me say it again. Bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. Resentment. Bitter, bitterness comes when there is a soul wound that has been left unattended. A bitter person is someone who has not dealt with their wounds appropriately. A bitter person who has not taken the time to be healed by the word of God, who has not taken the time to seek counsel, to seek the Holy Spirit and allow that healing to come forth. For many various reasons, many are bound with their wounds. And a wounded heart is an easily offended heart. Have you ever noticed that before? Wounded people are very easily offended. I was actually, I told you this is group therapy for me. I was actually, I came to realize the Holy Spirit really, you know, got on me for this, was I was offended because a born-again Christian was being easily offended. I was offended because a born-again Christian was being easily offended. But then the Holy Spirit said, well, ask yourself, why do you think they're being so easily offended? And then the Holy Spirit began to show me, oh my goodness, those wounds are deep. Those wounds are so deep. See, I had an expectation on a born-again believer. And they only came to hear. So I had offense this much. But I came to realize that one who is so touchy, so offendable, it really comes down to wounds that they have never dealt with. My daughter, she, I don't know if you've ever had this, but they're more than hangnails, they're ingrown toenails. She's had those, and they are so painful. Interestingly, this is just a side note that I read about, that they can be inherited. Do you know that offenses can be inherited? That's a Holy Spirit right there. Holy Spirit is speaking to some that you've been carrying an offense that was handed down to you from your mother or your father. And you're now carrying it with you. And it is now wrecking havoc. And there is no peace in your life because you have held on to the offense. And for whatever reason, maybe you've taken up the offense that came against your parents when it was their responsibility to deal with it. Okay, back to our session. But she had this ingrown toenail, and do you realize that it would get so inflamed, and, and it, was so, it was in such bad shape that even if she just grazed her sock on her foot, ow! It's because there was a wound that was not being treated. So what I did was I took her to a podiatrist who said, the only way that this thing is going to get healed is if that ingrown toenail is removed. So here it is. As I'm thinking about this ingrown toenail in reference to this message, I just happened to look up the surgery. No worries. I'm not going to put anything on the screen. 
But if I, it was interesting when I read the surgery for ingrown toenails. And this is what happens, what it said. The offending piece of nail is pulled out and removed. So what had happened was a piece of her nail had to die. That area will never grow back again. And the Holy Spirit is asking for some areas in your life to die because they will continue to be painful until they are removed. And they are only by removed by the great physician. And the doctor said, after having that ingrown toenail removed, you will never have this problem again. And I want you to know there's some people sitting here who have been dealing with an offense that has rooted so deep within your family. And the Holy Spirit wants to take that and uproot that today so that the root system is removed and that root system dies and it will never come back again. You know, there's processes towards healing. And I want to take some time to really take some steps towards freedom from offense through self-evaluation. Really, we walk around offended, but we've never asked ourselves why. So first, we must sort out our emotions. Why am I so angry and offended? There's wisdom. There's great wisdom in taking a time out and asking yourself, why am I so hypersensitive over this situation? So why is it that any word or or gesture, it it just hurts so bad? And then... Think about this. Evaluate your expectations. Many have brought expectations into relationships that are unrealistic. I thought it was realistic that my husband would take out the trash, but it's just kidding. He takes out the trash the majority of the time. But oftentimes, we come into a marriage with expectations. We come into a relationship, whether coworkers, whether just friends, we come in with an unrealistic expectation. And when that expectation is not met, I become offended. So in reality, it's our expectations, not other people that offend us. Hear that again. It's our expectations, not other people, that offend us. Many are walking around with a measuring stick everywhere you go. I mean, if you could just see in the spiritual, walking around with that stick, do you measure up? Do you measure up? Do you measure up? Some spouses know what I'm talking about. Don't look to the left or the right. Just... Look straight ahead. And then another question to ask yourself is, does your offense represent something internal? Maybe what you're so offended at in someone else is because it represents something that's actually in you. Maybe you're so offended at what you're so offended at in someone else is because it represents something that's actually in you. Let me give you an example. Example, Matthew 7, 3 says, so why do you see the piece of sawdust in another believer's eye and not notice the wooden beam in your own eye? I'm so offended at that sawdust in your eye. But recognize the sawdust that's in his eye is the same material that's in the beam. So I'm walking around easily offended at him when his actuality is I'm really offended at myself. 
I'm really walking around with great shame. And then you would need to ask yourself, am I being prideful? Living offended is tied to pride and control. Pride tells us that we're always right and I am entitled to a formal apology. I am owed something. Well, honey, sometimes you're just not gonna get an apology. So that does that mean that you're gonna go around living with offense until that apology comes? You're not responsible for anyone else's decisions or behavior. You're responsible for your own. And then eventually pride always leads to a fall. But those who are living in pride will see that their fall is actually someone else's fault. I don't go to that church anymore because brother, brother sister, and brother, sister, and so-and-so, they hurt me. I'm sorry, so you coming into the house of God, giving up worship, has stopped because someone offended you? And then the next question to ask yourself is, am I being disobedient? Jesus taught us how to pray, like I said, in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verse 12, forgive us as we forgive others. And do you recognize that in that area of Scripture, it was so important to Jesus That as soon as he is done giving that model of prayer, he immediately revisits this area. Because as soon as he's done with that, he says in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive the failures of others, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your failure. Reconciliation is a priority to God. That's why, you know, he could have said, let me talk to you a little bit more in that Lord's Prayer about what it means to give us this day our daily bread. No. He didn't take time to teach on that right away. He said, guys, if if you want to connect with the Father, you need, need to first reconcile with your brothers and your sisters because it's all connected. And lastly, let me challenge you to live like a duck. You heard me right. Live like a duck. Have you ever heard it said that it's like water off a duck's back? Do you recognize that the duck actually has Uh, creates this oil that gets into their feathers because when if you see that they're they're in the pond they're swimming around they're splashing all around but immediately they can go to flight is because this oil has caused the water to roll right off of them and their feathers don't get waterlogged the best time to decide that you're not going to get offended is when the offense comes And the less offense we take on, the less authority we give to the devil. Swift reconciliation is what God asks of us. Quick reconciliation. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now he's not looking at the clock. He's just trying to get through to you. You must reconcile quickly. And it's not even just for me. It's not even just for that, uh, that other person. It's for you. Because if you don't, you will live imprisoned. And it will infect every area of your life. Some 
husbands and wives are wondering why, what happened to all the intimacy? Because they've brought an offense into the bedroom. Why, why am I not connecting with my child? Maybe I'm offended at them because they're not following God like I want them to follow God. Why, why, why can't I get promoted? Let me tell you, God's not going to take you into the next season of your life while you're holding on to a fence. You can't walk through those doors with this big old fence. You might be wondering, God, I know you've called me, but why? Why the hold up? Why the hold up? Maybe it's because you need to let some things go. Maybe there's an offense towards God. Maybe there's an offense towards a family member, a coworker. But when you live like a duck, that means you reconcile quickly. Another way to not let offense seep in is to love the Word of God. Let me tell you what Psalm says. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Let me say it again. Great peace have they which love thy law, the Word of God, and nothing shall offend them. Do you know this word guards your heart? This word saturates and renews your mind. I know when I'm having some off time, it's because I haven't been diving into the word. Maybe you can say, God, now it's making sense. I have not been a lover of your word. I haven't been eating my daily bread. I'm malnourished. I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry, I'm mean. Maybe that's why you're mean, because you're not eating enough. Great peace. And then again, the, the duck, he produces an oil, and oil just coats him. And do you know the greatest defense against offense is to seek his presence. The Holy Spirit can saturate you. you. There are times when I know I cannot do this on my own. Holy Spirit, I can only do this by your power. Saturate me, empower me. And the Holy Spirit wants to put oil on you so those offenses will right, roll right off your back. Those who love thy word have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. I want to show you uh, one more video before we close, and it's this one gentleman who's a part of our, our church here. He recognized that he could not move on to the next season of his life while still holding on to a fence. Let's go ahead and take a look at that video. Hey, I'm Derek. Uh, Middleton, I uh, want to talk about love, walking in love, and unforgiveness. Uh, well, um, I got a job with uh, with an agency, you know, uh, working with someone, and the person that was over me, uh, yes, he did some things he shouldn't have done, and uh, he did some unlawful stuff towards me, and he ended up losing his whole team. Um, I wanted God to get him, get him, get him, you know how we do. So, um, in the intro, he was talking stuff about me. I was talking stuff about him. It didn't look good. You know, we both leaders and we both got a high position with the company, right? So my wife said to me about people, she goes, say, hey, man, you know, you need to walk in love with the person, go ask for forgiveness. I'm like, why? She said, because Lord tell me, tell you. I'm like, no, you ain't telling me, Lord, you tell me, tell me that. So she said, and even down, deep down side, knew that what she was saying was right, you know, being Christian and stuff, you know better, you know what's right, what's wrong, right? Just an old man fight against the new, right? So, uh, they don't put your gut in up. Old man fight against the new. And, um, they gave me a cert, it was a ring ceremony that I got in, um, last Friday night in Pittsburgh for doing great business, right? So I said, my, so then my agency manager called me the night before and said, hey man, you gotta get this right, man. 
you guys gotta, you know, work this out because it don't look good. Everybody watching you guys. So I said you are correct. My wife's saying the same thing. I know better. Make a long story short, I said to my wife, I don't want to go into the next season of my life or this business. And we're doing well, but I know we can do better without making peace. So I went to the individual, him and his wife, and I said, I apologize for what happened last year and this year about me talking about you, things that I did, uh, my transgression against you. Please forgive me, my brother. And he did. And I started crying. He started crying. His wife started crying. It's so emotionally. When they called me up, I grabbed him and my wife and brought him to the front with me when I got my award. And I couldn't even get myself together because I was just crying. And I, I cried myself free. I laughed myself free. And it was so cool. I cried myself free, he says. I laughed myself free. But I can tell you that you will not be free while holding on to a fence. And li Jesus has come that you may live a life that is free. Free from all offense, free from sin, free from unforgiveness. And to live a life that's offended is to live a life that's less than what God has called you to live. He's called you to great things. I'm sorry, but if you're here at Word of Life, you're called to great things. God has a call on your life, and, and you can put up that one picture, that little silly picture. He wants to take you through the next door into the next season. But you might be wondering, why can't I get there? Because your offense can't fit. You can take that down, please. <laughs> I want to really challenge you today. There are some people here that have held a fence. And, you know, you don't always get the opportunity to see the person and, and, and have a reconciliation one-on-one. -on -one. But, but God says... You can reconcile it with me. Of course, he, just like Derek, he went to the man. And, and even the Bible says, before you give your offering, go and make things right. I would challenge you today to hear the word of the Lord. Make it right. But he won't send you on your own. You have the Holy Spirit. He will give you the words to say. And again, you're not responsible for their behavior. You're responsible for yours. So I challenge you today to heed the word of the Lord, to get it right. And maybe you don't, it's, you don't have to go to that person. Sometimes the worst thing you can do is say, you know, I've been offended at this at you and that at you, and, and they never knew. But it's really something internal that you need to get right with God. So I would say there's people here that need to get it right with God. Can you stand to your feet as we close?